Hi, welcome to the Small Acreage webinar series. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range here in Colorado. I work with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and Colorado State University Extension. Here with me today is Noe Mary Moore. She's going to be talking with us about wildlife on your property. But before we get started, I'd like to point out the chat window in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. You can use the chat window to communicate with us if you have comments or questions throughout the presentation or even technical problems. We have Ruth Wilson with us here to make sure the presentation runs smoothly, technical-wise. Um, so without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Noe Mary Moore to talk to us about wildlife, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, and sit back and enjoy. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer. So as Jennifer mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about wildlife on your property today, and more specifically on preventing and controlling wildlife damage, because as we all know, there can be quite a lot of that uh, out there uh, in eastern Colorado and uh, across the state. This is the first time I've done one of these wildlife webinars, and since I can't see all of you out there in TV land, I wanted to go ahead and just introduce myself to you uh, how I can. Uh, my name is Noe Marymore, and I also work for the Natural Resources Conservation Service and also the Colorado Division of Wildlife. Uh, my background, my degree is in statistics and wildlife biology uh, here from CSU. And my areas of interest, kind of what I deal with on a daily basis, Include private lands, wildlife habitat issues, uh, wildlife damage management. Um, I've got a lot of interest in upland game birds and also some farm bill conservation policy. And just as an aside, I'm also president of the Colorado Wildlife Society, which is the group of professional biologists in Colorado. So a little bit about myself, which I could see you all, but as Jennifer mentioned, feel free to ask questions in the chat box there as we go along and we'll get those answered at the end of the presentation. All right, jumping right in. Before we you know, can talk about individual animals and what problems that they cause in terms of damage on property, the first thing we need to know is, all right, what is legal and what isn't legal for, for uh, dealing with wildlife damage, kind of indicated by the cartoon that we have here. Uh, there is some uh, law out there in Colorado statute that gives a little bit of definition on when we can control animals uh, on property without having to get, for example, a hunting license uh, or go directly through the Division of Wildlife. So the list of species that you see here, I won't read off all of them. Uh, you'll notice they're not big game animals. These tend to be uh, birds, small game type critters. If one of these are causing direct damage to your property, to livestock, uh, to crops, to a house, you can go ahead and deal with those directly, uh, like I said, without having to go through the DOW or getting any kind of special permit. So that's one good list of critters to know. There are also laws and regulations uh, regarding the discharge of a firearm. Sometimes with animals uh, that are causing problems, we do need to euthanize that animal or put it down. Um, and firearms or archery is one way to do that. In most cities, you cannot discharge a firearm legally. Again, that also includes bows. So you need to check with your city and your county if, there's, if you've got some kind of animal that's hanging around your property uh, that you would like to remove lethally. In terms of trapping, uh, Colorado passed regulations several years ago uh, that banned the use of uh, killing traps, such as body gripping traps and leg hold traps. So you do have to use a live trap for trapping any kind of critter that's causing problems. The animal must be immediately released or killed. So no, even though the raccoon that you've caught is very, very cute, you cannot give it to your kids and have a pet raccoon. You do need to either release or kill that animal. And it's important to know that you can't relocate or move that animal uh, onto another property without permission, be that public or private land. So, you know, if you're here in Fort Collins and you've, you know, trapped out something and you want to move it up onto the, the Forest Service, you'd actually have to call the Forest Service and say, hey, can I release uh, this raccoon that I have that's causing problems? So just some background information there on legality. Uh, a good resource that is out there are the yellow pages. You flip to pest control and you're going to find all sorts of companies that are out there and can visit with you more on the legality of animal control methods. Uh, and also the Division of Wildlife. This is what that agency is here for. Uh, if you have a question about legality or a specific problem, uh, problem animal, go ahead and call one of the main offices and they'll put you in touch with your local district wildlife manager who is the, uh, the game warden for your area. 
Um, the main offices for the Front Range are in Fort Collins, Denver, and Colorado Springs. If you go to the DOW website, they'll get you the contact information for the offices on the West Slope or out east if you're out in those areas. All right, so some big picture stuff. When we're talking about wildlife damage, the first thing we need to figure out is what exactly is going on. We need to identify the critter that is causing the damage. So just some pictures that I threw out on the screen here. On the, the far left, you see uh, some browse issues from deer and a windbreak. In the middle, you might be able to guess that, maybe not. This, the holes in the siding there are actually from a woodpecker that's trying to get at the termites that are uh, behind that siding in the house. In the top right corner, you'll see damage from voles in somebody's lawn. So the first thing is to find out, okay, what animal is actually making this damage? And from there, you can figure out why they're doing that. You know, animals aren't out there um, disturbing our property or our livestock or crops to be malicious. Uh, they're just doing what they do naturally uh, because of their, their natural behavior. And our job in terms of controlling that damage is to figure out, well, how can we modify the situation so that that behavior is no longer destructive? So, you know, it might be anything from deer eating landscaping. Well, there's a reason that they're going to be in your yard certain times of year. Um, the picture again in the top right, that's a type of woodpecker called a, a northern flicker. And in, you know, about April, early May, you'll hear them pounding on uh, any kind of loud reverberating metal that they can, which is really, really annoying and can be destructive, but they're doing that as part of their breeding behavior. And that uh, type of disturbance is going to end as soon as the breeding season is over. So getting that background information on what the animal is and why it's doing what it's doing is going to help you fig then figure out what control methods are out there or what prevention methods are out there that you can use problem. It might be something uh, like fencing, like you see in the picture uh, on the left. Uh, for livestock protection, it might be something like a, a guard dog. Sorry. Uh, it might be something like a, a guard dog or a guard llama even. We have those. Um, or a frightening device. You'll see a, a list of them there at the top. Um, things like tape players that play loud noises, gas exploders. Uh, there's a lot of different options out there. So those are the, the main um, steps in the process to identifying and controlling damage. And now what I want to do is go through some specific species and the damage that they cause. And these are the ones that I see most often dealing with landowners. Um, if you've got some questions about a critter that I don't end up going over, please, like I said, feel free to ask those questions at the end and we'll see what we can do for you. All right, the first one, and we see this all the time. This is probably the most common uh, critter that uh, I get complaints about in terms of wildlife damage, and that's deer and elk. That picture of the elk there uh, on the left was actually taken in Estes Park, for those of you who have been up there. That's a pretty common sight, elk on the main drag. All right, elk and deer. Uh, the first um, thing I want to talk about with them is damage to landscape and windbreaks. This is what we see primarily. There's a couple of different causes, uh, you know, reasons that they're out there uh, doing damage. The first thing that we see is bucks and bulls rubbing on small trees. Uh, the picture there of the tree is from a deer rub out um, by Strasburg, Colorado, during a, a bad winter. A buck was spending a lot of time in the wind, windrows there and decided to go ahead and just rub that tree almost to death, although a little part of it did survive. The reason that the bucks and the bulls are doing this rubbing is if you know a little bit about um, kind of antler development over the year, uh, about late August, the uh, velvet on the outside of the antler starts to dry off. That actually becomes pretty itchy to the bucks and the bulls. And so in order to remove that velvet, they start rubbing their antlers on small trees and shrubs. A little bit later in the year as we get into the breeding season, about October, early November, uh, now we see bucks and bulls that are thrashing their antlers against trees or shrubs as part of a dominance display uh, so that they can keep their, their little harem of does or cows that they've acquired. So we see that a little bit later in the year. Then moving into late winter, kind of that February, early March time frame, those antlers, as we all know, start to drop off. And so the bucks and bulls will knock their antlers against trees trying to get the antlers to drop. So basically, you're looking at a window from August all the way through February when you can be seeing rub damage, uh, landscaping, and windbreaks. 
The second cause is darn it, these animals get hungry, and especially during bad winters. Uh, so we see a lot of browsing on especially shrubs and small trees. What these animals are looking for and what they prefer are buds and new growth on plants. Those are the, the parts of the plant that have the most nutritional value. And like I said, we can see this kind of damage from browsing year round, but definitely in extreme winters like we had two or three years ago here on the front range, those, these critters will, will pile into areas um, that have a lot of windbreaks or high quality landscaping and just camp in there all winter long to stay out of the snow and eat on those plants. So extreme winters do become a, a problem and we see um, DOW helping folks out quite often in, uh, in those situations. All right, so that's the damage that deer and elk are causing. What can we do to help prevent and control it? The number one thing that I can guarantee will work every single time is to build a fence. If the critter cannot physically get to the plants, then there's no way they're going to be able to damage them. So that's the good news is that there is a solution. Um, in some situations, uh, the Division of Wildlife will let you use dogs to scare off animals if they're camping out in just one spot and causing a lot of damage. Um, however, that's a temporary solution, so another good thing to do is, you guessed it, fence. Hunting is a solution that, that some folks have used. Our hunting seasons for big game are in the fall, so again, you're looking at a period um, just, you know, a couple of months, uh, October, November, when you can scare deer out of an area. That's not going to help you in the spring and the summer. Uh, so an alternative to using hunting to scare deer out of an area would be defense. Um, you'll see on sale a lot in the farm and ranch stores commercial chemicals. These are things that are made out of um, the chemicals that are in uh, spicy chili peppers. You'll see some that are made out of dried blood, some that are uh, have a sulfur smell. These chemicals are all designed to repel deer and elk as they're eating on plants. They don't tend to work incredibly well. Oftentimes, the first rain that you have after you've applied them, uh, they wash off and are no longer effective, or they just uh, lose their potency over the course of three weeks or a month. So they might have some value for very short-term protection, but one thing that I can guarantee you is going to work in the long term is to fence, fence, fence. And uh, you can tell it's, that's something that I'm pretty gung-ho about is just ending the problem once and for all. All right. The other thing that you can do to try to prevent some of the damage um, as you're going and starting to do new plantings in your, in your yard or with windbreaks um, is to use uh, species that are not palatable. You know, not every plant is created equal in terms of what a deer or what an elk wants to be eating on. Uh, the website that is here on the screen, and this will be brought up a little bit later in the slideshow as well, um, this is from the, uh, the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management, and they actually have a pretty good list of what plant species um, are favored by deer and which are not favored by deer. So the idea there is you can go and look at that list and say, well, I'm going to do the landscaping around my house and I think I'm going to choose X, Y, and Z species because they're less palatable. So that's the uh, kind of the quick and dirty of deer and elk damage. All right. The next critter that I want to move into are your rabbits and jackrabbits. And they can be pretty pesky from time to time. Rabbits really like brushy areas. They like thickets. It provides a place for them to get out of um, view from aerial predators like hawks. Uh, lets them get out of the way from foxes and coyotes. So really shrubby areas are where these rabbits and jackrabbits want to be. In the fall and in the winter, as the green vegetation that's out there on the landscape starts to dry out, we see that rabbits are going to eat more shrubby material. So a lot of our shrub damage can be, uh, we can see occur more in the fall and in the winter. Um, we, we also see that rabbits prefer trees and shrubs with thin or smooth bark, uh, just because it's easier for them to get through. Although uh, if they don't have, you know, their uh, preferred food in, in any given windbreak, they'll just kind of eat on whatever was planted there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, deer also really like to browse on tree rows and on shrub rows. So a lot of the times you can have deer and rabbit damage in the same area. And it's pretty important to be able to discern one from the other so that you know how to address these. Because uh, you're going to, as I mentioned, address the deer damage probably differently from the rabbit damage. 
So if you have a shrub or a small tree that's been browsed by deer, you're going to see a jagged edge uh, where that branch has been uh, basically ripped off by the deer. You know, their teeth are made for clamping down and pulling, which leaves a jagged edge, as opposed to the, the lower twig uh, picture on the screen here where you see a very clean cut from a rabbit's incisors. So the cut on the twig is one clue. The other is the droppings. The rabbits are going to leave just very round, small pellets, and a deer is going to leave uh, an oval-shaped dropping. So those are the clues to figure out what's causing the damage uh, on your trees or on your shrubs. So with rabbits, there's several different methods to preventing their damage as well. One is to keep the brushy areas around your property or around wherever the damage is happening to a minimum. Like I said, they want that shrubby hiding cover. So if you can mow uh, between things like your, your tree rows and the windbreak or keep the, the lawn mowed down around the landscaping around your house, this is going to discourage rabbits from wanting to spend too much time in the area. Now another uh, effective short-term solution is to go ahead and shoot and trap out the, the rabbits just to remove them altogether. You do, like I said, have to obey um, all state hunting regulations. Rabbit season tends to be in the fall and winter. Um, if you do trap the animals, uh, they will move back uh, if they're not removed far enough from a property. So we recommend releasing trapped rabbits about two miles away. And again, you can't release them without permission from the landowner where, uh, where they're going to be released. All right, you guys would never have guessed that I had a fencing slide coming up, but I do. Uh, the best uh, deterrent for rabbit damage, again, is going to be fencing, just keeping the rabbits from physically being able to reach the plants that they want to be eating on. Woven wire or chicken wire is pretty effective, and that fence needs to be about two feet high. The sketch here on the screen that you're seeing is actually a combination deer and rabbit fence uh, around a, a small tree. And the idea there is that that chicken wire goes up about two feet to keep the rabbits out, and then up to uh, the branching on the tree is some woven wire to keep the deer out of there as well. So you can combine some of these methods if you need to. All right, prairie dogs. This critter is never controversial in Colorado, I can tell you that. Actually, I deal quite a bit with prairie dogs, both on the conservation end of things and also on the needing to remove them end of things. Um, so we'll go over real quick uh, kind of some of the damage that they can do and what the control methods are. One thing I, I should bring up is that we do have three different species of prairie dog in Colorado, and I'm telling you this not just so that you can relay the message at cocktail parties and sound very smart and advanced, um, but because there are different laws and regulations concerning how the, the different species can be controlled. So basically east of the Continental Divide, except for the South Park area, is our black-tailed prairie dog. The white-tailed prairie dog is in northwest Colorado, except for North Park, which is the Jackson County Walden area. And then the Gunnison's prairie dog is in southwest Colorado and that South Park Fair Play area. All right, the reason that's important, like I said, is that white-tailed and Gunnison's prairie dogs are proposed or already have protections under the Endangered Species Act. And because of that federal protection, they cannot be controlled in the same manner as the black-tailed prairie dog, uh, which is uh, very easy to control because it's only managed by the state and has no federal protection. All right, several methods to control prairie dogs. Toxicants is the method that we see used mo most often, and toxicants is basically just a fancy word uh, for poison bait. Uh, a lot of times we see a, a bait uh, put into a rolled oat and those are placed in the hole and the dogs eat the bait and die in the hole. Humigants are another method. Basically that's a small capsule that's placed into the prairie dog hole. The hole is then closed up either by stuffing some newspaper into it or uh, just knocking some dirt into it so that the hole closes. That little tablet releases gas which again kills the prairie dogs in the hole. Uh, trapping is used actually quite a bit on the front range but we do see a lot of problems with folks trapping out prairie dogs and then releasing them on private property without permission. Um, so you do, again, have to make sure that you've got permission to release the prairie dogs if you end up doing the trapping. Uh, shooting uh, is another method. It can be pretty popular just from the recreational standpoint. 
um, although isn't entirely effective just because of how quickly and voraciously these critters breed, you can shoot them all out and then the next year you have just as many prairie dogs as you did just from the few that are remaining. Um, a new method for prairie dog control that we're seeing on the market now are concussive devices. And these are actually uh, devices, you can see the picture there kind of on the left hand uh, corner, the rodentinator. These devices uh, basically send a little stream of oxygen into a prairie dog hole and then there's a spark at the bottom of the pole on the device. The spark ignites the oxygen and basically blows up the hole. The concussion from the force of that explosion is what kills the prairie dog. Um, I don't know that they're entirely cost effective or efficient. I can tell you they look like a lot of fun. So that's, that's the two cents on concussive devices. Um, one thing that we do ask uh, landowners to keep in mind when they're doing prairie dog control is that there are other animals out there that use these properties, or sorry, that use prairie dog colonies and use the holes. Uh, one of those is the burrowing owl, which is actually a, a species that is listed as threatened um, at the state level in Colorado. The reason is these critters uh, go and they actually nest in prairie dog holes. They're present on prairie dog colonies from about March to September. And if someone is out there treating either with poison baits, with uh, the fumigant techniques, or with the concussive devices, while the owls are in the holes, they can uh, uh, be treated as well and uh, can kill the, the owls. Them being a sensitive species, we ask that people do the prairie dog treatments after October 1st um, and during the fall and winter to about March 15th when the owls come back. Like I mentioned, the, uh, the poison baits tend to be the most um, popular and effective method for killing prairie dogs, and part of that is because they're used in the winter when the owls are gone, but also when there's no green vegetation. So they're one of the um, preferred food sources, those rolled oat balls, uh, for prairie dogs in the winter. So if you're doing toxicants, you want to be doing it in the fall and winter anyway, and that helps avoid uh, killing any owls uh, incidentally as well. All right, the last one I want to talk about is this is one that a friend over at the Division of Wildlife said, please, you have to mention bears because I deal with them all the time. Uh, bears are, are, you know, a critter that we hear a lot about on the news these days as they're coming down into town more and more. The thing with bears is that they are both curious and hungry all the time. Uh, so 99% of the problems that we see with bears revolves around food um, and bears breaking into things looking for food. You, you know, you often hear if you run into a bear, you know, a sow bear, and she has a cub, they'll get aggressive, and they will do that, but we don't really see a lot of uh, conflicts around properties um, with that sort of situation. Like I said, bears are hungry all the time, and they will eat almost anything. They're omnivorous, they're going to eat fruits and berries, they're going to eat meat, they like to scavenge on carcasses quite a bit, they'll eat the trash out of your backyard, whatever they can get their paws on. Um, and while they will cause problems year-round, we see a pretty big increase in late summer as bears are really trying to lay on fat prior to the winter hibernation. And also in years where we don't have a good mast, which is our acorns or berry crop. Uh, those are pretty important foods uh, during the, the summer and fall. And when those plants fail due to an early frost, we see bears coming down into town to scavenge a lot more. So, like I mentioned, big problem with unsecured trash cans. You wouldn't think this, but bird feeders are um, a major source of bear problems. The millet and the sunflowers and the seeds that are in uh, bird food, poundage-wise, have an incredibly high uh, protein level, which is what bears really want is protein and fat during the summer and fall. And so bears always go for bird feeders to raid those. Uh, there are several um, beehive operations across the state, well, quite a few of them. And, you know, the honey isn't just for Winnie the Pooh. Our black bears really love these as well. And so, you know, here's a picture of a, uh, a hive down. This was outside of Longmont that a bear got into and went and destroyed that, that producer's operation. Um, this picture is a, another local photo from the front range. Someone had left some food in their SUV, and the bear decided that, well, why would doors or windows want to stop him? And went ahead and broke into the vehicle and basically ripped it to shreds. Um, so bears, again, can be a pretty big problem. In terms of preventing and controlling damage, the number one thing for bears 
is to secure food and trash in containers that they can't get into. So, you know, no leaving a cooler out on your front porch that has the chips and salsa in it because the bears are going to come to the cooler and eventually think, well, maybe I can get into the house as well. Um, same, don't store food in your car. You know, bears have a wonderful sense of smell, and if there's food anywhere unsecured or even in a trash can that is not bear-proofed, um, they will get into it uh, and just make a mess. For folks that have uh, beehives or orchards or uh, an agricultural crop and you're experiencing bear damage, there are several electric fence designs that are out there that have been fairly effective at keeping bears out. There's just a quick sketch of one there on the slide. The Division of Wildlife has a new fencing brochure out uh, called Fencing with Wildlife in Mind, and it's got the, the whole schematics for uh, how to install those fences, and so that's a very good reference that you can get from the, your local Division of Wildlife office. All right, so that was the quick and dirty talk that I had for you all today. Um, on the slide here is just a few more um, references or resources that you can go to to get more information. Uh, the best website out there by far is the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management, which is actually run through uh, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, the Colorado Division of Wildlife link, link there um, is to their contact page. That'll give you the phone numbers to all the local offices if you need to get a hold of your local district wildlife manager. Um, and then also I've got my contact information there. If you've got a question, uh, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call at the office and um, I'll try to answer your questions and if I can't, at least point you in the right direction and get you in touch with someone who can. So thank you very much for all coming on today and uh, I hope some of this has been uh, helpful. And with that, I think we're going to take some questions, so I'll turn it over to, yeah, to thanks, let us know. Noe. Thanks, Noe. <laughs> um, we do have one question. Oh, a few are coming in. But the first question um, is just talking about ground squirrels. Mm -hmm. And she has a lot, of, a lot of them on her property. She's wondering what she can do. Yep. For things that are tearing up lawns um, or landscaping, and most of the times what we see, they're not actually moles. They're voles, which is basically a... a a group of critters, it's like a tailless mouse. They're the ones that leave the little above ground runways that you see in the spring, kind of after all the snow has melted. With those, poisoning is really the only way to go. Um, what they're doing is they're running underground and they're eating roots off of um, your grass plants, any flowers that are in the area. Um, so some of the, the toxicants that are out there are, are the way to go, and you can get those at your local farm and ranch store. Uh, there's actually a, a product, it's also called the Rodentinator, although it's not the same as that concussive device that I was talking about earlier. It's just such a great name, everyone uses it. Um, it's basically a, um, like a pole with a wheel and it has a little drop box on it and you can run it along the burrow and it just deposits a little bit of the bait, I think it's like every three or five feet. Um, so that's kind of a quick and easy way so you're not having to bend down and, and put the, the bait into the hole by hand. Mm -hmm. The next question is, what are the toxicants that are lethal to raptors that prey on prairie dogs? Um, basically, any toxicant um, that um, is going to be lethal to the prairie dogs will also be lethal to raptors. Um, a lot of our toxicants are aluminum. Uh, they're aluminum phosphide based. Um, the good news with the toxicants is that um, the prairie dogs tend to die in the holes. So the raptors, the only other raptor that's going to be in a hole is going to be the burrowing owls, and they will scavenge on the dead prairie dog and probably also pick at the bait. Um, but for your red-tailed hawks and your ferruginous hawks and the things that are hunting above ground over the prairie dog towns, it's very rare that a prairie dog is going to die on top. Um, and, um, you know, just eating off of one dead prairie dog isn't going to expose a raptor to a high enough dosage. Um, to kill it. So really our concerns just for those owls and some of the other critters, you know, like badgers, um, that sort of thing, that are going to be in the holes with the dead prairie dogs. Okay. The next question is, what about skunks? <laughs> yes. Um, for those that aren't aware, um, skunks are actually becoming a, a bit of a problem this year. We're seeing a, an epi epidemic of rabies in skunks across eastern Colorado. Um, the first thing that um, I guess I should say is if you see a skunk during the day that's acting aggressively, um, make sure that you, you don't or your kids don't or your pets don't go anywhere near it. The best thing to do if you see a skunk out during the day is to call the Division of Wildlife. Um, 
you know, they're probably going to tell you to go ahead and shoot that animal um, just to, to be able to put it down. Uh, some of the local county health departments are currently accepting um, skunks that have been killed for testing uh, to test to see whether or not they have rabies. If you do have a skunk that gets into your dogs or, or into your pets um, and you see a bite, bite wound on your pets, please go ahead and get that skunk into the Division of Wildlife or to your county health department or into your local vet for testing. Um, we have had dogs that we've had to put down recently because a skunk tussled with them and, and passed on rabies. Um, if you do end up having to shoot the skunk, um, you don't need to worry about really getting rabies from the dead animal. What you want to do is just get some gloves, um, take a, a black trash bag, um, inside out, pick up the skunk, put that in another trash bag, try to keep it cool, and then, like I said, get that into the DOW or the health department. Um, beyond that, you know, skunks can be a problem, when we're not talking about rabies, in digging up um, kind of the plants and that sort of thing around your home. And for that, trapping and removal is going to be the best way to go. I would suggest calling um, one of the um, pest control agencies if you've got skunks that are denning near your house or being a problem on the landscaping, um, just because if someone's going to get sprayed, it's better for them to get sprayed than you. So go ahead, and if you're having uh, landscape problems, to go ahead and call the pest control company. Okay, thanks, Noe. The next question is, what are some humane ways that we can go about killing trapped animals? Um, there are um, several different ways. If you can trap an animal and then take it to some place that you can shoot it, shooting really is the most um, uh, humane way to put down an animal because it is an instantaneous death. Um, if you can't do that, uh, one method that um, you can use you know, within um, city or, or county limits um, that, you know, doesn't involve the discharge as a firearm is drowning. Um, if you've got, you know, maybe just say a few prairie dogs on your property and you need to control them, you can trap them. And then if you have um, like a, a kitty swimming pool um, or, um, you know, an old horse trough that you're not using, you can fill that with water and just put the cage in. Um, you know, it causes some stress to the ob animal, obviously, through drowning. Um, it's not as quick as shooting, but it is uh, another method that uh, you can use with or a method that you can use with Okay, now I think we have one final question here. So what about pack rats? <laughs> what about pack rats? They, they can be a pain. Um, for any kind of really small-bodied rodent like that, you're going to need to um, use some kind of lethal control, probably a, a poison bait, and just be very careful where you place that bait so that household pets can't get to it. Um, with rats, with pack rats, you only have a few of them. You can live trap them um, and then kill them afterwards. Um, but because they um, can breed so quickly, kind of a, a long-term uh, poison bait solution is the best way to go. Um, and again, your local uh, pest control company can come out and do that for you as well. Okay, we have another question, but um, because we're out of time, I'd like to just bring up a survey, a couple survey questions that if people need to leave. Um, please just answer these quick questions before you leave so it can help us in the future. The first one is how would you rate the usefulness of this webinar? The second is do you plan on using some of the skills you've learned in this webinar? And finally, what topics would interest you for future webinars? So while you're answering those, if you'd like to stay on, um, we have another few questions. The next question is what are some regulations for releasing trapped wildlife on public land? Yeah, you generally can't um, just because uh, the public landowners like the U.S. Forest Service um, or the state DOW just don't want to deal with problem animals um, as much as the you know, private landowner doesn't want to deal with them. Um, if you do end up trapping something um, like a fox, you can call your local DOW officer and see if they can um, get you an exception for doing a public land release, um, or they might be able to get you in contact with a, a landowner who has a large property um, where the animal might not be a problem there. Um, but for folks that are kind of closer in um, into town and, and don't really have, you know, kind of that large-scale landowner that they can, um, you know, let a, let a critter go on with permission, it, you're probably going to be looking at some kind of um, lethal um, euthanasia type of situation. 
Okay, and I don't think we have any more questions, so we'll stick on for a few more moments if you have any final comments or questions. Otherwise, thanks for joining us today, and um, I'd like to remind you the next webinar is on June 10th on effective forest land management. So, so thanks so much and have a great day.